Any any adjustments to the agenda? Um, any, uh, we're not going to uh, assign a timekeeper time tonight, we're just trying to keep moving. moving. Um, um, any public any comments? Public comments? Don't know that we have public unless they're there. Yes, that was, that was expressed to me uh, regarding the uh, two-hour delay that we had the other day because of bad roads. That being that there were some of the uh, staff members who felt they were being punt. Because the roads are just. Yeah. Is Peggy breaking up for anyone else or? Maybe it's my Okay. Peggy, break a little bit. Okay, let me find, let me find a different spot in the barn here. Let me see here. Uh, is this working a little better? Can you hear me better yes. here? Sounds better. Thank you. Yes, okay. Okay, I so I'll repeat. A concern expressed to me regarding our two hour delay that we had the other day because of bad roads. That being that there were some staff members who felt that they were being pressured or asked to come in at the usual time, even though the roads were bad. And I guess my feeling is that if the roads are too bad to run the buses on, then we shouldn't be asking staff members to come in at the usual time because the roads are just as dangerous for them as they are for the school buses. I'm happy to comment on that. Did you? Yeah, I'm happy to comment on that, Peggy. So we certainly have some employees that we do need in on a regular time, like maintenance folks, to make certain that we yeah. are open. Uh, we try to get front folks in as quickly and swiftly as possible so that we have correspondence with our buses on delayed starts. And then we also do need our staff here to receive students because students can stop be, start being dropped off by 9.30. So we ask people to yeah. Yeah. as quickly as they can in a safe nature. And that's what's in the yeah, okay. well, staff handbook. And uh, so that's certainly what we would reiterate to staff. Well, good. That, that's what I hope would be reiterated. But anyway, that was a concern that's expressed to me. Thank you. And I'm happy to clarify that with folks. Um, Shannon, I have something that I shared with Andrew um, and Jane, and I guess I could jump in with it now. Um, I think it bears further consideration. But I've had um, constituents reach out to me about the green and gold scholarship and the way that it's awarded. Um, so that's the scholarship that gives you. Um, and for some reason, my voice is really echoing and it's really distracting me. So I apologize. Um, I, I'll turn my my microphone way down. Um, my speakers. So um, that's the scholarship that pays for four years of tuition for someone to attend UVM. Um, last year, our two highest GPA um, award, award winning students, um, neither of them chose to attend UVM. And there are other schools that um, maybe establish a cut score at like a 3.76 and then ask students to. Um, write an essay and then that essay is blind scored, you know, and that pool is only kids who would commit to UVM or some other process that would mean that this scholarship worth quite a bit um, wouldn't be wasted essentially. So um, there's a request that we launch sort of an exploration um, so that one of our kids is able to get that scholarship to go to school. 
I don't know <laughs> if I that as well that, as it have, uh, but I'm I'm sorry, Lisa. Chris is pointing out that the feedback seems to be coming from the um, live room. Is it possible for you to mute the mic when board members are talking over here? Sure. Awesome. Thanks. I think that's a great point. If someone, if one of those students isn't going to use it, we should be making sure it's going somewhere that it could be used. I guess a, a quick question about that scholarship is it, you said it's only for going to UVM? To my knowledge, it's a oh. UVM award to each high school in the state. So there's one. Her, her. Yeah, so we're going to add this to the agenda on, in January. Um, so I think, I guess we should come up with ideas about what um, what we think would be an appropriate way to award it and maybe find some examples from other schools and then we can have a full discussion in, in January and hopefully make a decision so that students have plenty of time to apply and whatever. Did you have something to say? Uh, yeah, I, I was worried that Lisa was going to say that uh, we didn't award it to the student with the highest pure GPA, which is what generally is expected by UVM. They do allow it the administration's discretion if they feel like there's an inflated GPA because of the choice of courses. It encourages us to look at the, the rigor of a student's schedule and earning that GPA. Uh, so we do, in fact, on, on very rare occasions, factor that in. But I'm always worried about catching flat back because we didn't go with the valid, you know, valedictorian, which is pretty specifically what UVM is looking for. Okay. It's the top student academically in the school. So there's not discretion for it. It's not a, they don't ask for an application process. They ask for the student with the highest GPA. And they say if there's something like transfer credits from a homeschooler, maybe that gave somebody a really high GPA, that we could make an exception to that based on circumstances, which we have on occasion done when we have a student who's taken a lot of AP classes, for example, and challenged themselves, and somebody else maybe took an easier schedule, and the GPAs are almost the same, but somebody pushed themselves in high school. Right. Yeah. Um, so, Lisa, did you have examples of other schools that did it a different way? Yeah, I yeah. mean, I, I can, if we're going to move it to another um, another agenda, which is fine, I'm happy to collect um, some and bring them. I think Jamie said that he could do that, too. So maybe we should um, pull those together and jump in. I think, did you say January? I wasn't hearing what was being said in the room very well. Yes, January. Okay, that sounds great. We'll be ready. I'll be ready. All right. Um, All right, Andrew, I'm going to hand it back to you. Um, we're up to number five. Okay. All right, well then, um, I ask for a motion to approve the minutes of Tuesday, November 16th. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 That's our approved. Um, is there any board comment at this time? Or did we just uh, I have some some um I have a, a question, I guess. So at what point um do we start thinking about mandating that the people in the school, the adults in the school be vaccinated? It's FDA approved now for adults, so it could be mandated. It's We have to get past the emergency authorization, um, which is where it still is for our students. But I think that especially with the crazy spikes we have seen this year, and the disruption, the constant disruption to our students' education, 
we need to be thinking about um, mandating vaccination for people who are coming into the building. So the Agency of Education is going to actually do that for us, Shannon. There's supposed to be a memo coming out. Now, there's some legal battles happening right now around I'm sure. around employers uh, mandating vaccinations. So I know that the AOE attorneys are in on this. And so my plan was, as soon as we received the directive from the Agency of Education, to immediately implement that directive um, was going to be my take on that. And certainly, as a as a board you could take a stronger take on that if you chose to not wait but you definitely have su employees um, that work in your building as well um, as white river unified district employees so that really seems like it's something that the full board should take up if the full board doesn't want to wait for that aoe um, directive we are well we over 95 percent vaccinated uh, across the su with our staff. Do we know as a district what the percentage of um, adults in the building are? We're over 95% SU wide. I can certainly get your figure for White River Unified District. You're one of the higher districts. Any other board comment? Okay, we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Uh, good evening. I hope you're all well. Um, I'm sure that uh, the faculty and staff are very excited that uh, tomorrow is um, going to be the last day before break. I think we all need to recharge, myself included. So. Uh, I'll put an email out, but I just let folks know I will be out of the office um, Thursday until next Tuesday. Um, and I'm encouraging all of our administrators to try to get away and uh, fill their fill their tank with what I expect to be a pretty, um, you know, pretty rocky uh, next few months with COVID. Um, uh, stay, you know, stay tuned. I'm, I don't know what's going to come out around guidance around contact tracing, just so folks know. I do know the Agency of Education indicated that schools were not going to be responsible for contact tracing over the holiday break. I don't know if that is a preview with what, what's yet to come. Um, and what I mean by that is New Hampshire is no longer contact tracing within schools. They notify a positivity and they ask the positive student to leave. Um, I will tell you that as an SU, we've done a thousand antigen tests over the last few weeks with, for close contacts. Um, we're keeping up, but I will tell you that we won't be able to keep up if we can continue to see numbers um, increase. Other than the good news is some of our elementary students are starting to hit the vaccination threshold, which will relieve some of the pressure that we've seen. Um, so I hope that what we'll see is that as vaccination increases, that even if we see greater positivity, and I think we would be fooling ourselves if we don't think that we're not going to see additional spikes in positivity in the community um, based on what we're seeing for data. Um, that due to the fact that we do have more folks vaccinated, that we'll have less folks participating in tests to stay. Um, and so that hopefully will make it a little bit more manageable. Our numbers around test to stay have been very small um, in regards to positivity. I know of only one positive result across the SU um, through antigen testing. Um, so I think that that speaks to the fact that our mitigation efforts are working. So we have all these students that would have been quarantined that are now in school and learning in person. Um, and it worked. We had a positive student that we were able to catch and then isolate and have them leave. Um, so the test to stay program is certainly uh, working well. I'm just, uh, again, it's just another strain on the system. That's all. Uh, we were able to bring in two medical assistants that we're covering via ESSER. Um, they are stationed right at your two buildings, uh, one at Bethel, one at Royalton. Uh, and, but they've also assisted us in other places across the SU when we've had um, 
you know, significant positivity and needed some support around uh, test to stay. I would say though that at this point now, all the buildings have their legs under them for the most part. Uh, and so that they're able to implement test this to their own at this point. Um, and then the waiting, I talked about um, the waiting study that came out. Um, and so the task force that did the waiting study presented really two uh, different proposals. One that would change the weight of students via average daily membership, which would then would affect equalized pupils based on, and that proposal is focused on those students in middle school actually increasing the weight of middle school students, which is not the case right now. Um, and it focuses on increasing the weight for those students um, that would qualify for free and reduced lunch. Uh, based on your current free and reduced lunch and enrollment numbers, uh, that proposal shows you uh, increasing um, in equalized pupils. And then there's the second proposal um, that is looking more at um, uh, like a, a, a grant funded mechanism to support ed funding. So it would actually take away equalized pupils and students who qualify for free and reduced lunch or in your middle school or in a high school um, would be awarded a dollar figure from the ed fund that would then come to us. And even in that proposal, uh, we would benefit. So we would benefit both ways in regards to our tax rates, uh, which the thought process then is, is it frees up uh, more resources for us to then to invest in our students um, at our schools. So uh, I'll continue to follow this closely. Right now that it's come out of the task force, the legislature is definitely gonna do more research on it. Um, I do expect more reports on this. Uh, and more testimony. So stay tuned. But in general, uh, for White River Unified District, it, we look like this would uh, be a benefit to us. And they are their proposal does uh, result in a five-year phase-in um, if this is adopted by the legislature this coming uh, school year. And then the only other thing is, um, and if you looked at your VSBA email today, they talked about it, it was brought up at the full board meeting, is that they do expect the legislature to take action um, once again, on um, providing the flexibility around having Australian ballot votes uh, if the school district approves that um, and or to de delay a vote if needed. So that won't, we won't get approval of that until January, but as we're talking about budget, uh, it's something for us to be thinking about before um, we go warning a meeting. And then finally, the only other thing is, based on all that information, is, is that I've, uh, I've taken what I think is a solid assumption that you would be fine with us once again doing our own mailer. Um, we got positive feedback about that um, last year. Um, and I think you've done it now at least for a couple years. Um, and so I've talked to your town clerks and indicated that that was our plan unless I heard differently. And I'll take any questions folks have. What's the, do we have a sense of what's the percentage of the five to 12 year old kids that have uh, um, started taking the, getting the vaccine? I, I heard on the news that it was like 90% uh, in that age group have gotten at least their first shot statewide. statewide. Uh, do we have any sense of Chris, I haven't had the heart to ask my nurses to pull that data. Uh, I was going to let them rest and that they, they're the ones that have access to that. I don't. Uh, but I was going to have them run those figures for me after break. Okay. Yeah, and I would just say too that you know our, our twins have been doing the, the test to stay, uh, I guess last week and this week, uh, uh, and uh, and just say thanks to you know to Ms. Schumann and, uh, and Shane Oaks and everybody else that's involved with it. Uh, the kids, uh, you know, drop them off, they go in, and I don't hear any complaints or anything about it uh, when they get home. So uh, I think it's been smooth uh, so i think the people that are administering it i know it's a lot of work but i think they're doing a good job thank you thanks chris yeah they're doing great <laughs> oh yeah sorry i forgot i saw andrew out there yeah ushering kids into the school it's okay <laughs>
for Jamie. Yeah, I, I do think the separate mailer makes sense. That's awesome. Thanks. Did a good job with that last year. So. I appreciate that. Give me more time. Quick question. Yeah. Chris's, um, Chris's comment reminded me that I meant to ask. Uh, is there something going on with the heating system at Bethel that we need to be aware of? No, we had an issue like you've had issues for a few years, <laughs> and we had to reset and it's fine now i mean okay. we need to deal with it <laughs> but yeah no okay uh, principals good evening we didn't plan who was going to say what first but <laughs> <laughs> i would say for <laughs> we'll echo what Superintendent Canardi said we're, I think, ready for a break uh, and have been working hard on wrapping up this, this end of the new year. Um, we continue to do what we've been doing in MCSS and meeting in our teams and a pre-K to 12 group, so that feels, feels good, slow, but good progress. Um, just had a meeting this week. And just um, trying to actually plan for summer too, which feels so far away right at this very moment. But ahead to PD opportunities this summer. We had our district universal MTSS meeting yesterday afternoon uh, and there was a lot of excitement shared by middle school staff about their work around restorative practices which is mentioned in our report but it was heartwarming for me to hear how invested they are in and how they really really sense that that's gonna gonna be a game changer at the middle school. Uh, likewise, I think what we're doing here at the high school with Lead'em Up has the potential to really change the, the community and the, the culture here. Um, just in the last couple weeks, it feels a lot, uh, a lot more safe and kind in the hallways. And I don't know to what extent it's connected to that or not, but uh, this feels like we're moving in the right direction. If you were here, I would have asked you to t step outside for a minute and take a look at our green team wall where all of our green verified students are, are named with a couple of special quotes about and their contributions to our community. Uh, but that's been going really well. I pick up now. <laughs> uh, our community outreach continues and continues. We, as an example, we did a recruitment night at the Sharon Elementary School and it turned out very low turnout, but very positive. The two families that came are set up for visits when we get back, and we'll continue to reach out. We're also gonna go over to our sud and do the same thing in January. We have um, also been doing some work with our Act 67 grant, and kids have been doing some after-school programming and in-school pod projects. It's uh, Things are going pretty well, all things considered. I would also want to focus on the test to stay as a community piece, that the communication on that has been very good. I haven't done it. That's probably helpful. And that, um, but folks have been really helpful. Parents have to stay the first day, and they're queued up in the parking lot, and, and everyone to a person has been supportive. The kids have been great, and the support staff that we put in place for for um, folks entering the stuff into the computers, meeting people, and also actually doing the swabbing. It's been very, very positive. I think the last thing that isn't actually in our report, but I would highlight, and I think it was in Superintendent Canary's report, is um, we've been working with Katie McLean on our communication, and uh, we did finally launch our elementary specific middle schools had already had their uh, specific Facebook page, but also the high school specific Facebook page. Um, and we have a couple coordinators, uh, Jamie Rainville and Kate Lucia, and then numerous people in the middle school who are helping put out all the good things that are already happening here. And that it feels good because I think we are doing a lot better job of celebrating what's already taking place here via the Facebook pages. So um, There's also two, you okay? Yeah, I'm great. Two other things. Um, <laughs> Our Yellowstone trip that will be in the summer has become so popular that we have, I think, 18 kids 
and three adults that are attending. And we're pretty excited about that, and they're making their way towards that. The other thing that's happened, and you'll see it very soon, is we have our digital virtual concerts for the elementary and middle school. And uh, we're, they're separate, of course, and we'll be sending those out. We hope to push out this week. I know the middle school is going to be queued up tomorrow. I'm not sure if we'll be able half to do Half of the it. elementary is currently done. We're almost there for the other half. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was part of the delay day that um, put a little bump in the road. So good things are happening. Yeah. Any questions? We'll say the Facebook content has been really nice. Um, I've enjoyed seeing that. Yeah. Um, one thing on the COVID uh, communication, I'm wondering in the new year if we're going to keep every time that somebody's there's positivity in the school, if we're going to still have that same notice go out, and that might be for gaming. Yeah, no, the plan would be that we'll still have a notice go out. I It'll probably be a little more compacted notice, like just an email blurb and a phone call that says check your email. Um, I get sick of hearing my own voice. <laughs> <laughs> I get all the calls across the SU. I'm, I've, I've been discussing that with Shane um, about how other schools are doing it, and other SUs have shrunk their communication down to what exactly they need. Uh, so I do think you're going to see a change in that after the year. But we'll still always we'll always notify if we have positivity. Right. Okay. Yeah. I've just been finding, you know, when there's if we do have a big wave and it's basically, you know, many times a week, then mm -hmm. it might make sense to do some sort of summary or some SUs are board doing board a summary. Board. Yep. And so I've thought about that too. I did a lot of commitments around when we first started this that I would always let folks know. So I want to stay true to that. So I just got to figure out how do I roll it out to the community so they still feel like we're being transparent and supportive, right? Like that they have this information, right. but also not have a place where, like, here we go again. Right? Like, here's another robocall or here's another letter. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, I, yes, I am working on that. Okay. Thank you, though. It's yeah. good to have that question come up. Yeah, I do think maybe just like a dashboard or something. Yeah. Like, you know, if they're curious or something like that. Good. Anyway. Any other questions for the principals? All right. Um, Tara. So you all have my report. It outlines the due dates that we had for the month of December for both the business office and the child nutrition team. And we are gearing up for another round of grants in the child nutrition team. We're working on a local food grant and two, uh, the federal and the state equipment grants are rolling out. So I'm working with the team to try and secure some additional grant funding. So that's really the only update since I provided my report and then I, the budget and the audit are later in the meeting. Um, have you gotten the equalized pupil numbers from? Andrew? We have first draft. And yours, I have them right here. It was not positive direction. Nope. First draft for Rudd, dropped from 597.98 to 573.53. Okay. So we're uh, working through that with the A. Have you looked at our numbers too? Well, there was a drop in Bethel, so Ray and I were anticipating a drop as far as that campus was concerned, but we didn't think it would be that substantial. So. We're working through trying to figure out which ones they're not reporting next. So. Okay. Yep. Um, We're not alone. It's always the state. <laughs> sure. Um, if you wouldn't mind forwarding on on the email. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Tara? We'll be talking to her lots in a little bit. Okay. Um, we'll move on to. Um, 
so quickly before um, I kind of go into student council matters, I'm also part of the Performing Arts Center um, committee, and we just held, uh, we just had interviews for two construction companies that are, will be working on this project, and we have ended up hiring DEW Construction, and we are now scheduled to have a budget meeting January 13th, so that's kind of where we are in that whole um, deal. Um, and so then for student council, we have started a hot chocolate fundraiser, so we're selling hot chocolates every Friday, and they're like about a dollar, and so we've already started getting some funds from that. Um, and and then we started talking about more like <coughs> topics within the school and everything. We discussed the lead em up and that assembly and everything. And we actually, it was pretty mixed feelings about it. There were a lot of people that liked it and thought it was very nice how like everyone was involved. Everyone seemed like they were enjoying it and like could understand like why we were having it and all that kind of stuff. But then there were some people that thought it could be a little bit more student oriented or stuff like that because we do have that green committee. Um, so there's that. Uh, and then we briefly discussed uh, the dress code that um, we kind of feel like it should either be kind of like uh, not in the handbook or enforced. And we feel like right now it is kind of in the middle there. And so it ends up being like some teachers kind of have their own dress code and like other teachers like kind of just feel like it's not there and all that kind of stuff so that's really all we discussed so far. Can you tell the board about today's concert and uh, spring musical? Oh yeah so um Exciting stuff. yeah we just uh, had we just held auditions for our spring musical of mm -hmm. Mamma Mia and uh, the castles came out today so that should be starting pretty soon I think it may um, I think uh, practices may start after winter vacation, so that'll be fun. Um, and then we had a concert on the green today for band and chorus, and we performed for the elementary students at the South Royalton campus. Um, and so that went really well as well, so, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Bruce. You're welcome. Any questions for Grace? Thanks, Are you Jake. getting proficiencies for the work you're doing on all this? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and I hear you saying that you're gonna you're part of hiring the DEW group. Yeah. That's something I've never done. Yeah, no, it's it's actually kind of funny that the main guy or the project manager um, that's a part of that uh, worked for my dad when he was <laughs> in high school. So then he called my dad afterwards and was like, Guess who just interviewed <laughs> for a job? And I was so, good. so So yeah. Document it. All right. Task forces. Task forces. Uh, I kind of gave the recruitment side from the middle school, so um, you know it's uh, we're still meeting. We're going to set. I don't know. If, I couldn't attend last night, so I'm not sure if we set a date for our side. But we we're ready to go. We did. Okay. It's coming in an email to you. Awesome. I confirmed the Lindy today. I'm looking forward to it. So that's the middle school side, and we'll keep doing that. Mm -hmm. We have an advertisement that will be coming out in the first of the year, uh, much like what you saw for the middle school, uh, for the high school. Um, speaking to, we, we spent a bunch of task force time talking about that. We got teachers working with Kate McLean, our coordinator of communication, um, to put together a similar ad like what you saw in the Herald at the middle school for the high school. Um, and that will come right after the first of the year. Let me report out about preschool. So um, I think what we came to was a recommendation to add a 1.0 teacher so we could increase to having the opportunity for two preschool classrooms on each campus um, and adding um, 2.0 uh, para-educators. So 1.0. 1.0. Yep. Sorry. That's right. Sorry, it will have like two, but we'll add one. It's all right. I got to shift it in my brain. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Uh, so, and I think the only other thing that came out of it is um, what Renee and I talked about was once we make this recommendation, kind of the task force is done. But I think the task force was sort of feeling like there's more phases to this. And so if the board would allow us to continue, we would like to um, 
continue with meeting eventually and making recommendations for future years to, to keep building this. Yeah, so your budget, when we do your proposal, that does, your budget that you have tonight as presented does increase uh, 1.0 teacher for pre-K and a 1.0 para for pre-K, just so folks know. Um, and uh, I would say to the board, I think that there's still definitely more work to do when it comes to pre-K around additional length of programming and, you know, how do we recruit for child care. And so I would certainly encourage the board to continue that work. Like, I think it's important work. Um, I thought, was there going to be, um, did we communicate with Magic Mountain about doing a partnership with them for we did the last meeting the representative of magic mountain came um and i think what my takeaway from that was maybe if board members would like to meet with her board members that might be a better communication direct communication than communicating with via her and it sounds like she while they support um, uh, doing something together is really strapped with not having extra people to do more right now so I think the idea is up there and, and they're not opposed to it, but also not wanting to strap themselves for being able to do what they, they're trying to do to help us. Shannon? Shannon, did you have something? You're muted, Shannon. There you go. Sorry. Um, so going back, um, what what is the new plan for the preschool? Are we adding, are we going to be able to do full time for three and four year olds? Are we adding any hours before and after school? Yeah, so I think what we talked about was all those things. And I think what the baby step, the first baby step that we talked about biting off was having enough capacity so we didn't have to wait list kids for year one. Uh, and that we do want to get to a place of being able to have early drop off and extending the day. Um, but uh, I think that's why we were asking for this team to be able to continue meeting so we could maybe like year two add another layer to this. I think we thought year one, making sure that both campuses had the capacity to have two classrooms and could have extended daycare or extended care for three year olds. Um, which equals what four-year-olds are getting would be step one. Okay, any other questions? All right, negotiations committee. Shannon, do you want to speak on that one? I, I can. Um, so we have been meeting with, um, as a group, um, and we have our proposals on our side ready to go. Um, we've had one meeting with the teachers where we went over ground rules, um, and so we're still waiting um, back. But that actually went really well compared to some of the other ground rules meetings I've sat in on. So um, I think we'll move forward pretty quickly. Um, the challenge is, I think this time of the year, there's basketball that goes late and there's, it's, um, it's the holidays. So we were supposed to have a meeting tonight with the teachers and that, that has been postponed to January 6th. So um, with the support staff, we were able to meet every week and just bang things out. And this looks like it might take a little bit longer. So. Yeah, it's been good. And thank you, Shannon, for being part of the committee. All right. Um, so we're on to 8 1. Uh, audit. So I provided you all your draft FY21 audit and a memo that outlines some of the highlights throughout the audit. And if you have any specific questions, I can attempt to answer them. Otherwise, it went very well, and it's very exciting to be December 21st and have draft audits and have an approved SU audit last night. So I'm very, very happy with the way this audit process went this year. 
Can you just hit the highlight for the board around the audited surplus? Yeah, absolutely. So if you refer to the memo and also to the audit, if you have it, um, page 18, the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. Your general fund balance for FY21 was a surplus of $1,318,209. We had the deficit in FY20 of $399,151. So it left a general fund balance as of June 30th of $919,058. So of that surplus, the 1.3 for FY21, the majority of that was a result of you all receiving $864,000 of federal funding, which is what required you also to go through the single audit process because that's a mandatory requirement if you receive over $750,000 in federal funding. So that's why you had to have that. So by receiving those funds, we were able to supplant because ESSER doesn't have, and the CRF funds don't have the same supplanting requirements and disallowed that we do in our titles and our school-wides. So we were able to offset budgeted items with those federal funds. And the breakdown of the majority of where your savings were, you had about $863,000 in school instruction, $75,000 in the administration, 274,000 in building and grounds, 47,000 in athletic and field trip transportation, and then 36,000 in your debt services. And you can find that by department budget to actuals on pages 80 to 81 of the audit. And just so I'm clear for the board, does this, the budgeted, the uh, audited surplus, that wipes out the food service debt too? Yes, this does. So on the fund balance page. Which is an important thing to know because that is something we needed to take care of. Yep. So on page 16, which is the balance sheet, the non-spendable fund balance, the 19209 that is our district's prepaid for retirements. The restricted of $187,068, that's to bring the child nutrition program deficit to zero. And then that leaves the unassigned fund balance of $712,781, which is the surplus remaining that can be used to offset revenue in FY23, but also you can go to your board, your communities, and ask them to put those funds in your reserve funds, which we would highly recommend that you do. Right. Which we're going to need to continue to talk about as we touch it. Yep. So, um, the $187,000 to pay off the food service, do we do that basically including it as a food service transfer from the general fund to, like, we include that in our budget for this current? Nope, it actually is, it will clear it right out at the end of June 30th. It's a journal so, entry we do in the system. So it just show up in like our financial report as yeah. instead of doing $53,000 transfer, we do 100 Yep, yeah, it's 187. Plus yeah. 53. Yep. Yeah. Correct. Got it. Right? So the only thing in this draft, um, they had not had an opportunity to complete the Bethel Campus Student Activities accounts. So I just actually got the revised draft that has the financials for that. So I will get that reviewed and get that sent out to all of you. So we'll take action next Yeah, time. I wouldn't take action on it tonight until you've all had an opportunity to review the Bethel Student Activity accounts. So are we able to publicize this now? Do we have a audit draft? And I yeah, I mean, we, we can definitely publicize it. We don't release the draft. I mean, if people want to see the draft, they can come, but the official bound copy is once you accept it and we have the final. Right. No, but yeah, I just mean like it. we had... That number's... It's right. secure. Yeah, it's yep. a secure number. We, we had multiple front page yep. <laughs> about the deficit. It'd be nice to get something on, you know, about... To be great. Absolutely. So forth. Yep. Yes, it's a confirmed. And um, if, if the board would like, I'm happy to work with Kate on doing working with the Herald to yeah, get some coverage on it. 
please do. Um, so on that page 80 um, thing, I just had a couple of curiosity questions. Um, the long-term principal and interest line didn't match the budgeted line. I'm just curious why that. Matched. We had a reduction in your bond payments. Oh, okay. That's good. And you'll see that in your FY23 budget. It's also adjusted. And that wasn't because, like, the interest no, rate getting, changed or something? No, you're getting closer, so principal starts to drop. But uh, what I mean is, like, isn't that isn't like the pay structure set at the beginning? Like, no, you, know it, you have there? when I look at your bonds, you have a tiered payment, so it's dropped. Right. So Twenty five thousand, it dropped. No, this but year. like you, you would be able to say when you take out your bond, this is what the payments are going to be. So if right. you refer back to your bond schedule, right. So we just need to do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's there. Yeah. Um, and then what, what was the board of ed? Um, like it was sixty thousand dollars for stipends, and I was just curious what that was. So the auditors d group things together differently than we do in our budgets. So under the Board of Education, they put stipends, salaries, and benefits. They lump it from our financials. They pull different function codes and, bunch and okay. bump them together in their departmental description. If you want the specific details, you can refer back to page. I think it is schedule. <laughs> sure read it. No, it's just the way that they, the yeah. auditors, lump them together. You guys are paying yourselves to have two salaries. That's yeah. That'll be in the buffer pool. You can, you can email me about it. <laughs> Different story. <laughs> <laughs> trying to find line by lines. Yeah, it's later on in the report. The line, the actual line by lines. Okay. All right. Um, anybody else have any other questions about the audit? And I mean, also, like, the really, the biggest <clears throat> news out of all of this is the notes on um, page 111, where there were no findings. Right. That like, that's, that's, auditors' jobs are to find findings, so we had none. Thank you. Congratulations. That's so exciting. <laughs> A lot of progress. Well, if nobody else has questions about the got it, let's move on to the budget. So I noticed when I was reviewing the materials that were sent to you that some of my comments didn't come over in the pivot table. So I just wanted to point those out quickly for you, which is one of the ones we just talked about. On the first two lines of the, of the, the budget there, the 1100, 101, and 102, there was a note there adding one pre-K teacher in Royalton and one pre-K para in Royalton. So that didn't come over in the printed version that got in your packet, so I apologize for that. So overall, this is the compilation of the two prior budgets that you have seen, broken down by your support staff and then your teachers. And then this adds in all the other function and object codes throughout your line-by-line -line expenditure budget. Some of the highlights on the additional codings that changed um, down on 320 contracted instructional services, you'll see there's an increase there of 14,000. Uh, that's just based on increasing for FY21 actuals under the general elementary. And then the next. Uh, could you? Yep. You're saying increasing it from the FY20 actuals? Yes, so um, when we were doing side by side comparisons on your FY21 actuals to what was budgeted for in FY22, if we saw a substantial discrepancy between that, we increased in FY23. Well, just so it rolls like it up there, but in our section, 
when we break down general elementary contracted services was fourteen thousand dollars short based okay. on what was actually spent so we increased it there right but like if you look at the lot that were pumped all together it's forty thousand dollars less yep. than yeah the overall budget so it's because that lumps it all so when we actually look at it line by line so would it make sense to transfer some from one of the other codes that's not being used or it does so in one campus um the budget was two thousand dollars that's what every campus had for contracted services um other than your district-wide or yes district-wide which was 62.5 all the others had two thousand dollars so general elementary ended up spending sixteen thousand so we increased the two thousand to sixteen thousand for that line item and then um, the others maintained at two thousand and then uh, your campus-wide or district-wide is still at the 62.5 so if you want to make adjustments there, you're welcome to do so. Just need to let me know. And then the SU central office and special education budgets were approved last night by the full board. So you'll see on all the object code 593s that are specific to those assessments, I've made a note that they'll be adjusted once that's final so your next draft will have your actual assessments in there and now you can see when we were doing the prior drafts like in student support there seems to be a substantial increase there and that's because that's where we put the flexible pathways position so i've made notes where we've made those specific changes so you knew where they were going And then the next section is down in technology. I don't know what page that's going to be for you, Parker. It starts at function code 2490. So you'll see that down at the bottom, the object code 650, 734, and 735. We made some adjustments there. And that's based on the Agency of Education's Universal Chart of Accounts that we have to use moving forward. They are now considering technology hardware and software as technology supplies. So you'll see we've reduced those and moved it up to the supply line. And then down at the, towards the bottom, you'll see that um, function code 3300, community service operations, uh, teacher salary has been added to the budget. And that is for the Act 67 community coordinator, which is a requirement that we talked about in your last draft of the budget that we have to budget for that locally. So that's that $43,000 that's been added there. So overall, this budget as presented, is a $351,623 increase, which equates to a percentage of 2.92%. So just to add, I mean, so as far as programming goes, this um, continues to support our expansion of pathways. It also um, supports half of the community schools coordinator position as we receive that grant the idea would be that that position does encompass both campuses so we would budget for it locally half time um, but then look to fund it so that it doesn't just go away once the seven hundred fifty thousand dollar grant goes away um, so i want you to know that that position <coughs> is funded is 0.5 in there it expands your pre-k uh, by a 1.0 FP and a 1.0 Pura. Um, it ensures that we have a full-time pathways coordinator at this campus and at the middle school campus. Still keeps a 0.5 SEL uh, support person at the middle school campus. Um, it keeps your MTSS 
um, social emotional folks on each campus. It keeps a full time uh, coordinator of student supports. Ashley Grout was short staffed this year, so she's having to split her time via intensive programming coordinator and um, that position because we couldn't find an intensive programming coordinator when we hired Annette for, at the SU level. Um, but that remains budgeted full time. She will assume her full time position again uh, doing that work. So in general, it's keeping the staff that you have, but also looking to enhance. Uh, and we had talked about the 3% being the kind of the benchmark for you guys on the expenditure side. So that is something that we continue to look at. I do expect as the principals, Tara and I sit down again, there could be some tweaks in regards to supplies, things of that nature. Uh, but know that we are keeping that 3% kind of at the focus point for us. Um, and on the revenue side, uh, which will be the next time you get the budget, we are going to be down equalized pupils, um, which, you know, if it's the number that Tara had, that's going to hurt our, uh, our per pupil spending. Um, what I will tell you, though, is we will have some revenue to put toward the budget. I would caution us from using a bunch of that one time revenue because one way for us to think about that is you almost start in a, in a deficit the following year um, when you do that because that revenue goes away. And so I think we gotta, we gotta watch a few things. The yield, which is looking positive, certainly. Uh, our equalized pupils, we are going to try to leverage Medicaid funds uh, locally. And so we do expect that we're gonna be able to provide some Medicaid funds to offset cost of nursing um, for folks. Um, which is, that's a revenue we haven't provided before for nursing uh, at a level that we should, we will be able to. We didn't budget any, just so the board knows, Andrew was there, but we didn't budget any Medicaid funds at the SU level for next year. All the Medicaid funds are going to be dispersed out into the local districts. Um, and so uh, know that we'll have some added revenue there. And um, we'll certainly continue to leverage your title funds. You guys still receive, uh, through target and ranking, a pretty solid chunk of title funding um, that we'll continue to use on the revenue side. So the CLA is the other factor, though, we don't know yet, which I'm worried about. As good as the yield looks, I'm worried about the CLA. Um, and so that's a big piece of information we, yet, we still don't have. So I think what we're looking for tonight is is are these expenditures making sense are we investing in the areas you want and knowing that if we can make the revenue side work and keep you know taxes at a reasonable rate that this is something that you're feeling good about or if you're saying listen i'm hearing folks and they're saying that we're not in a good place financially right now as as a community and 3% seemed to write a month ago, but now it's not feeling as good. So I think that's the type of direction we're looking for from the board. Um, this, this is Lisa. I think that the investments that you're looking at making make a lot of sense. I mean, thinking of our community and the need that our community has and the direction that we're interested in going. I think it's worth supporting this budget and continuing to move in what I consider a fiscally responsible direction while at the same time meeting the needs of our students. Um, so I appreciate this budget. Yeah, I do think the preschool increases will hopefully help with their equalized pupil numbers, which I wouldn't expect them to be completely revenue neutral or anything like that, but they should be offset some by being able to accommodate more students. I, I agree. I think this is a good start. Um, I did have a couple questions just looking at the numbers. Um, the art salary was up a whole bunch, and I was just curious why. Um, like, was there a change in... I think it's still cleaning up coding per where people that were coded. So they were you had an art teacher that was shared with Eco, and I think 
it's still trying to clean up the percentage of FT coded to the right area. Well, do you know what the plan is going to be for that going forward? Well, will we still have more to those? come. More to come. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. If we have a solidified plan yet. I mean, it's to. We certainly want to continue to increase eco, uh, but ensure that we don't have any decrease in programming with art. And so, we're looking at what makes the most sense in regards to how to staff that. Having the someone who could do art and eco, we understand we may not find that. Um, we certainly weren't able to find it for the remainder of the school year. Right. But we want to ensure that the programming doesn't change. If anything, we're actually hoping that we can increase potentially eco. So as far as this budget goes, it looks like art is then up basically a half FTE and we kept the eco the same. Is that an accurate representation of what happened here? You shouldn't have shifted. I don't think we really were talking about any shifts. So I, don't I, I don't believe we can talk about it after and clean it up, but I believe that possibly our current art and eco person wasn't coded. Was coded to, at all? To yes, if I remember right. Let's so this budget all, represents yeah. the art teacher split 50-50 right. between elementary and secondary. And I, and I believe that in the past, it got old coded toward eco. And so, now, do you see what I'm saying? So we have a teacher who's licensed, who does art and eco. Her whole salary was coded to eco. And is what, what a, is eco like one of the separate function codes? I don't remember saying that. Or is that just in the elementary? It's in the eco elementary. Eco is part of your elementary yeah. or your secondary yeah. So So whatever shift would have come out of the right well, right and that's part of why when you look at your elementary teacher salaries they're not up much yeah. okay do you need people around where they need to be all right that answers that question um, no, it's a good question it's something we're going to need to note and one of the things that we're doing now um that we put in place this year within the business office is we're actually putting on on contracts what their account code is so, and when someone is reassigned within a building, the administration sends notification into the business office letting us know there's been a reassignment so that salaries can be adjusted appropriately throughout the budgeting periods. Okay, that's good. Um, and the intervention um, line, I think you said something about it. Could you just go over what is going on with that, so Same idea. So we this is coded for remedial intervention to exactly the FTEs in the folks that you have providing remedial intervention. Um, where at other times those folks were coded as elementary instructors in general ed. Um, and so what we've done is we've coded folks based on what we know now. Now that could adjust, right? Like numbers could spike and we need to reassign someone who's doing intervention to teaching universally again but where we were at this is based on what we have right now and what we're predicting those folks who will do intervention versus teaching universally okay. the FTEs in your building didn't change it's just what they're doing is right. adjusted. other than adding the two do you think it would be possible maybe in the notes for the reg regular ed stuff say you know 30,000 to this, 30,000 to that, or whatever, so that it's easier to see. Yep, you know, where those working. adjustments yeah. happen. Yep. Yeah. Um, guidance. So we have three FDE for guidance, and that's basically Jenny Lane's retired and we haven't replaced her, right? Yes, you have. No, we have. We did replace Jenny. So what happened was um, Hannah. Glass Pictures, he left us. Um, and at that time, Nicole Lamoff was reassigned. Um, and we took the money from that reassignment to hire a, a middle school pathways person. That's what Owen's desire was. Um, we then took uh, another 0.5 position um, that we had and were able to create the SEL position, which is what Cass Bath is doing. Um, and then we took 
and leveraged Medicaid funds that, that Claire Martin can draw down on and ESSER funds to bring in school-based clinicians and so that we have a school-based clinician who can do counseling work individually with students on this campus and we have one at the Bethel campus. Um, and then the idea is that as our school counselor at Bethel gets her legs under her, I do think she will be able to expand some more. She has started to already. Yeah, she already she has to, to the middle school. So the idea was that we would have two school counselors on this campus. High school is a different beast. It really needs its own school counselor. But we'd have a campus counselor over there doing K-8 through school counselor here. But actually, our ability to actually intervene through therapy has increased. Um, we not only added the school, two school-based clinicians, we also added an SAP counselor at the high school and an SAP counselor at the middle school that sees and works with groups of kids too. Um, so the three that we have currently, so there's two on this campus and one in Bethel, and is one more on the kind of college and that that's sort of thing? Yeah. yeah, that's the high school school counselor. And then we have one that's kind of general. Well, ones that's hyper-focused on elementary for the most part. And then you have one, and then I would say that at the high school level, what we're really trying to do is define it. If a student needs like therapeutic or social emotional intervention, that is where we would use the SAP or we would use a school-based clinician. Like if someone needs therapy, the idea would be let's get them with a master's level therapist who can get them in a schedule and see them on a weekly basis and not get interrupted. One of the worries I have in schools is, and what I was seeing across RSU, and certainly what I experienced as a principal was, we would have school counselors, especially, especially at the middle high school level, try to set up meetings with kids, like to do therapy, and they get interrupted. And so then the therapy gets interrupted Oh, I'll see you tomorrow, I'm sorry, right? Like a note at lunch. And then what I think the unintended consequence is is that we say to Owen, that wasn't important. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to really do is make certain we have devoted folks to do that type of work where they wouldn't get interrupted because that their schedule is sacred and that's the most important thing. Okay. That um, but I do think, again, that's something we're going to need to explain. Right. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say, I think that at some point we kind of asked for like a board chart or whatever for all these positions and that would kind of be helpful for keeping track of. I think you guys should definitely hold us to that for next month because that's something we've talked that. about and we should do. So we will, we will do that with the next budget presentation. Okay. I can answer your other question. Okay. So if you look at the Board of Education 2311. Uh, this, on this one, yep. on the budget? Yep. Okay. And you look at the first lines, the, oh, admin, yeah. Yeah, the admin salary of $1,800. So we're looking at FY21 actuals. Mm -hmm. And then the FICA of 138. And then the workers comp of 48,476. That gives you the $60,414 that's reported in your audit. Okay, and the workers comp? We pay that under the board and it's budgeted under each individual position. So you'll see under each function code that there's a workers compensation because it's driven by their salaries. Okay, um, but like uh, why was it so much higher than budgeted at that time. Because your salaries were substantially underreported to your workers' compensation carrier in the past. Okay. And, and I've been working to get those adjusted each year to where they need to be. And, and now it'll add up and be in the bill code. And hopefully we don't have substantial audits at the end of the fiscal years. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and my last question was uh, the transfer to food service has clearly been less than necessary every year. So now that that's assessment. moved to the SU, that becomes an assessment. So once we're able to establish our trend in revenue for the child nutrition program, we'll be able to better establish what your assessment's going to be moving forward. So that will actually become part of your fiscal assessment to the central office. Okay, and is it, um, and presumably that'll be completely, like, 
each each district will have kind of been contributing differently depending on yes what, so what their so individual that. needs were. So that's why when we centralized food service as of July first, that's why every district has to bring their food service whole at the close of twenty one because it now is an SU right. enterprise as of July one of twenty twenty two. So. Um, so is that going to change for the next draft of the yes. audit? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. I and should. Um, the requirement for the child nutrition teams are to have their monthly claims in by the fifteenth of each month for the prior month, so that I can submit for the reimbursement. So right now they're just barely wrapped up their November. Mm -hmm. So I only have right now September and October until they have November done, and then I'll be able to see our trend for revenue based on utilization of the child nutrition team. So that's so when I do the next round, I will have an idea of where the assessments need to be for the child nutrition. And do you have any sense for? Uh, we are we are serving a lot of meals, but no, I do not have any sense because I have not <laughs> done anything as far as projecting revenue for child nutrition at sure. this point. Okay. I do think we had a record for revenue in this particular we district. Have. Yes. Uh, this year, which is pretty cool. Yep. And we're the program that we're currently working under the seamless summer option, the reimbursement rate is higher than the regular child nutrition mm -hmm. program, just like it was when we were working last year underneath the seamless right. summer option, the um, summer food service program. So that skews it a little bit when we go back to normal. So yeah, how long is that going to, is that? Right now it's just through this year. Yeah. And then, you know, depending on what happens, so we should I can't make any projection for that. We should probably assume that it's going back to regular. And we don't get the rates, reimbursement rates from the state until. Right. I don't know. We got to watch the legislature. I think yeah. there is an appetite in Montpelier for universal meals. For universal meals. Yep. Uh, and I suspect there could possibly uh, be a uh, well, a significantly large contingent who might want to use some of the um, surplus in the Ed Fund to help support that phase of that. So I think that is something we're going to have to watch. Um, certainly, you know, as superintendents, we're very supportive of universal meals. We're just looking for some assistance and funding to make that happen. Um, and so I don't know if that's something that the legislature, they, they definitely heard we need to pr provide some funding in order to make it happen. I think there's an appetite to, to make it happen. Um, so stay tuned. From a parent's perspective, it certainly is convenient. <laughs> yeah, and I think it, we have more kids eating. Frankly, yeah. like right, like I, I, eat, well, as you can see, I eat. Days. more kids than superintendent. I eat <laughs> in middle school, and I eat at both your campuses at least probably twice a week, one in each campus, and there's a lot of kids eating. And, uh, superintendent, and they uh, um, the the staff does a great job. The food's awesome. I'm really happy with the quality of meals coming out of these two buildings. And the, the feast that they've had in each building, that it was really well done, and having the student involvement and the classroom involvement, there was just so much excitement around the feast for each campus in the last two weeks. So that was really exciting. Um, well, those were all my questions for the budget. Um, do you guys have anything? All right, so I guess. Um, so next draft, we'll come back with um, additional adjustments to, on the expenditure side and your revenue side. Uh, what is the yield um, number that you're using? We are going to use the more conservative yield of the 12,937. Nice, no, it's still a good job. All right. Pathways okay, uh, we'll move on to the Pathways Programming and Personalized Learning Alignment with Graduation Credits. So, um, something Rodney brought up, I think. Yeah, so uh, Rodney, thanks for, for bringing this up. Uh, Rodney asked uh, Andrew and I if this could go on the agenda, and so I talked a little bit about it in my report. I mean, what I would say is, is that um, 
I'm really excited about our incoming new pathways coordinator, uh, which I'll have re, re talk about in new hires. Um, that's going to be starting second semester. We will have a devoted um, high school pathways coordinator who's coming to us from Green Mountain um, School um, down in Chester and who has extensive experience uh, teaching both in the secondary and post secondary area. Um, and so I will say that. It is the first interview I've had as your superintendent that I spent an hour and 15 minutes with a candidate. And I did it because it was just such an engaging conversation. And so I, would, I share all this because it was clear to me that he has the same belief system and vision for Pathways that I believe we do as a board and as a community and certainly what's set out in the legislature. And that is the concept that students can take learning experiences sit down with a facilitator of learning, a pathways coordinator, and then link proficiencies within our curriculum toward the experience and product to demonstrate that they are proficient and then we can award credit. That is something that we've done in small segments prior to this year. Um, I would say we're doing it more now, even without a pathways coordinator, the plan is to do that in a proficient way, of which is what is in statute, once we have a pathways coordinator. And so, you know, I think the vision for pathways is that it's all kids. We want to promote that all students can engage in pathways, but that the pathways coordinator will be there to help de develop the plan to it actually demonstrate proficiency and I would say right now part of the issue we've had now Tony's been great our middle school pathways coordinator has assisted some of our high school students with developing their plan and demonstrating the product that then can be acknowledged um, as proficient for credit because we still do graduate here off of credits our proficiencies are aligned to high school courses um, and then we award credits the now we will have uh, someone here and students could sign up and it's actually like a class block where they could build their pathway and that could be, you know, they're taking an early college course, right? It could be they're taking a BYU course that's self-paced. It could be that they've designed a plan and that they have work-based learning and that they've done, that they're able to demonstrate through a product around English credit and maybe even, um, you know, social studies credit. And the facilitator of learning, the pathways coordinator, is licensed in English. But what the vision would be is that they would then be able to have the time to work with other uh, content area teachers so that the content area teacher is assessing the products and is the teacher of record that then awards the credit, right? And so that's not the student having to do that legwork. That's the pathways coordinator's job is to support the student with that. And the other piece is, is ensuring that our schedule provides time for our teachers to have time in their teaching load to do that assessment piece. Um, and so I would say that the concept of students using things like extracurriculars, Rodney, to demonstrate proficiency, that is absolutely what pathways is. I would say the piece that we're still fleshing out is, is is ensuring that the student has that facilitator to say, it's not just the experience, it's how do you take the experience and demonstrate your learning. And that we actually empower the student to say, well, I demonstrate it this way, right? I'm going to create this product. And that our teachers then are engaging with the product to say, yeah, if you do X, absolutely that meets proficiency. Um, we are, that is, that is, what I just described is where we want to be. Please understand we're not there yet. Um, but what I will say is, is that I've been very impressed with the more conversation and the more experience I'm seeing that I think students are able to do this at our high school. Um, and... You know, I would say that one of the things about the candidate that reads Team Forwarded to me is that it's clear to me that there's um, a real vision and appetite to push that envelope. Um, 
to ensure that this is alive and well. Um, and I would say that that's what he's already doing in his classroom. And one of the reasons why he applied for this position and why his superintendent was willing mid-year to release him is because it is his passion. Um, and she recognized that. She was the principal that hired him, actually. Um, and she recognized that and that they didn't have the structures in place yet for that to actually happen and come to fruition. Um, but that certainly the, he can see that there's a real appeal and desire here for that to happen. Um, the other big thing I think for us, Rodney, is setting the tone at the middle school for students to even understand what this means. Like having experience around the idea that I can design a product, um, an outcome that's either based on an extracurricular activity or a work-based learning activity or just something that I'm really interested in studying that's relevant to me and I want to dive and delve into that and I want to really stretch myself in that activity and demonstrate proficiency across content areas. I really think we got to do a good job at the middle school of providing students opportunities for that because I think when you're in 10th and 11th grade and schools learn looked a certain way that what we're talking about right now is so foreign it doesn't even make sense. And so what I have been talking about with Owen and with Tony is, is how do we ensure we have a structure at the middle school that's allowing all kids to access? And I don't think Owen will be upset for me to say that that structure, we're, we're still working on. That. Absolutely. Um, but that is, the goal would be <clears throat> any student who wants to access a pathway would have a facilitator in learning and an opportunity to do so. And that the structure, meaning the schedule, would support it um, and not be a barrier to it. And so that's, that's the work that we're at right now. Um, I gotta say, I'm, a month ago, I wouldn't even have been this excited because well, cause we didn't have that, de that devoted person. We have some people doing pathways and they're doing it through alternative programming and some more intensive type pathway where that's good and we need that, but it's also about how do we create pathways that's universal for all, not that it's a target or intensive intervention that all kids can access. And so having this devoted person, I think, is going to allow more access to all. Um, so, I, I, Rodney, do know that absolutely it's our expectation that kids can, and students can demonstrate proficiency and achieve credit based on things like extracurricular activities. The, the other, the missing piece is, is that that has to then be connected to a, uh, a pathway project, a personalized learning plan, so that they can then say, here's my product, look what I've done, uh, in order to achieve it. Not just, you know, what we're not promoting is just, if you do X, it equates to a credit. We want the student to go through being able to defend what they did and how that demonstrates proficiency. So that there is a, there's a reflection piece to it. Um, before this uh, hire, was this um, kind of stuff going through Ms. Law? Or was there like a specific person that was? No, it was actually in your, it was in the, the course study, the guy that. Yeah, it's been in the program and studies for a while. Ms. Mr. Oaks manages a couple of student plans. Okay. Uh, we have an outside consultant who works with a couple of students on a couple courses. Um, Mr. Audley's done one with a student uh, a couple summers ago uh, for math. Um, so, you know, Mr. Polly did one for a piano student a couple years back. It's kind of like okay. where there's a student and an interest and a need, yeah. we've kind of made stuff work. Okay. But again, not you know, it wasn't like yeah. we didn't have the structure in place to say universally, this is what Pathways is and this is yeah. how you're going to access. Yeah. Okay. And I think, again, students who are going to be coming from our middle school that go through that are going to understand it even better yeah. versus peers that you have at the moment where I think some of the folks, we're going to have to educate, right? Mm -hmm. And it's going to take some students trying it out and seeing like, whoa, if I do work-based learning and pathways that I can demonstrate credit mm -hmm. and proficiency in ways that I hadn't necessarily thought of, right? Yeah. 
It's always a little bit like the VTVLC classes. They're yep. there and the program is steady. And every year, a couple, handful of students are like, oh yeah, I want to take this interesting class. Yeah, that's what it's I'm doing not. this year. Yeah. Um, but most students don't take advantage of it. Okay. And like, how do we recruit more students and push it out to engage more? Yeah. Okay. What's nice with the VTVLC classes is that they're already aligned to the proficiencies with the state of Vermont. So we don't have to do any extra work with that yeah. to know that everything's being filled that way. Okay. Yeah, it just, <clears throat> I guess you answered any questions that I had. Uh, it felt like, yeah, the pathways were starting, the flexible pathways were starting to work, and we just needed a little bit more. And uh, I think with this extra person helping, and we, we're getting there. And it just, uh, so yeah, you did answer my question about the flexible pathways, and uh, I, th I think it is coming along pretty good. Um, is this something we could track as far as like get a few examples of how it worked and the perfect like I'm this is the sort of thing that sounds great but I'd, I'd be curious how it actually winds up being implemented and it'd be good I think track, it could like, be uh, in January I want to start having your celebrations of learning right and so I think that as we get going it could absolutely be an opportunity for students to come in and actually speak to the process maybe as a right. celebration of learning. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe we could also put it, I don't know when would be appropriate, but you know, like as a state of the, do another update of mm -hmm. the flexible pathways. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and maybe at that, like have a yearly update on that or something with percentage of students there taking advantage of it. Might make sense for February and we could bring in the new flexible pathways coordinator and He'd have some idea of where we're headed at that point. Not, he wouldn't have a lot of. Yeah, he was just starting in mid January. He started January 21st, so he wouldn't have anything to really say about what we're doing in January. But in February, by then we should have had a couple of meetings. And we could also do it in March. Yeah, March would be great too. Yeah, I think it's important, and it might even be that it um, does have a place because the teaching piece. This is not how we went to school. And it's not how you're going right now. But the opportunity is incredible. And what you can build for a college resume, like the thing you did with DEW, mm -hmm. colleges are gonna wanna know that. They're gonna wanna know all your theater work. Yeah. And if that can be collected and somebody's helping you figure out how to package that too, and you're meeting proficiency on the way to graduation, mm -hmm on top of your other academics, yeah. it's going to make you shine, right? Yeah, right now I'm working with Ms. Waterman. Right, so Ms. Waterman's doing some of that work. Yeah. So I, I'm really excited about this opportunity. I think we should be teaching about flexible pathways in personal learning because we, we get it, we're educators, but not everybody in the larger community gets it either. Really validates all learning. Pretty exciting. So, do you want us to prepare something for January? A short little couple showcase? Well, I think we're got celebration of learning. So, if yeah. there's some middle schoolers who have done something, well, we have a couple high, high schoolers. Uh, I think that that could be a celebration of learning that doesn't take away. I, I want a celebration of learning every month. <laughs> something to kick our board meetings off to say, look, like this it. is like real. This is what's happening. Um, but then on top of that, I do think in March we could do, we get the budget put behind us um, that we could have a nice focused presentation on this. Okay. I like yeah, it. I think, um, I think it'd be great to do that for, for the flexible pathways part. At some point I'd be very interested to do a similar sort of thing with like eco, like where mm -hmm. are we, what can we improve, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing with are we, getting the proficiencies that we're hoping to get out of mm -hmm. our time that we're spending on the eco and stuff like that. And you know, doing on both campuses and stuff like that. So you know, you know, I think when we have these bigger initiatives that we're working on, like having assessment or you know, update or focus time, that's the focus time that we get there. So you know, why don't we put that in for April for eco or something? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm writing them down as future agenda items. Yeah, sounds good. Anybody 
have any other thoughts? All right. We'll move on to uh, possible action items, uh, 2021 audit. Since this is a draft, we don't have, or we are expecting another draft, we don't have any action on this. No, no action tonight. Move it to your next meeting. All right. Allotment for Winooski Valley School Choice. Currently 10, right? Uh, so we currently have uh, 15 allowed in, oh, okay. 10 out. And I think that was based on the percentages. Um, you have there's a there's a minimum number for in versus out and they're not exactly the same um, we don't ever hit so far we haven't hit those thresholds um, so unless read feels different I would just recommend we go with what we did last year based on yeah, those what numbers. are the current numbers I think it's a 15 that we allow right, in we're actually oh actually doing it we have two students who are out and one student coming in Really, we've had more in the past, but I think because of COVID, going into different communities has discouraged people from doing this as much as they have in the past, or at least around here. Well, I'd entertain a motion to continue our current Winooski Valley School Choice allotments. So moved. I'll second. Any discussion? All, right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. aye. <laughs> and that was a support, not an opposed, but I think. All right. Um, we'll keep that the same. That's passed. Okay. Um, resignations, new hires? Uh, We've got a new hire, I and mean, we don't have a resignation, but as the board's aware in the community now, uh, Principal McCracken has announced um, a desire or intent not to not return next year. Uh, so I wanted to take the opportunity to just publicly thank Reed for everything that Reed has done for this district, uh, specifically coming here as you were unifying as a new district and. You know, I think that the admin team in general, but certainly Reed and the board, I, I just got to praise you um, in regards to, I really, when I walk in here, it feels like a wildcat. And uh, I'm someone who was a royal, that grew up being a royal. And it's palpable. And I coached I coached at Wickham High School for a 1-19 season that was not successful. <laughs> but, uh, so I've been in both buildings, but what I would say is, is that um, the work that you've done with the faculty and staff and students to have this feel like a truly uh, unique new school, just thank you very much. Um, and uh, it's been a real pleasure working with you, Reed. So thank you. It's been a great experience. But. Uh... I think of it as graduating and, and uh, exploring something new. So I appreciate having had the four years of opportunity to work with all of you. Uh, from the board, we thank you as well. It's a really, really, you know, difficult time to come in and, and put in all that work, and we appreciate all the things that you've done to help build the school to where it is now. So thank you very much. Um, and so the other thing um, that I'll just highlight is that in the packet, I talked to you guys about a timeline uh, for principal search. Um, and so just know that uh, the position will be posted tomorrow. Um, and you'll all be getting, uh, along with the community, a letter uh, that talks about the position being posted um, and then a link um, I've asked Michaela Martin, who works at CVSU, to help facilitate this process. She's also helping facilitate the first branch unified district process. Um, I think having someone who's going to devote their time and effort on this is important, and that isn't necessarily in our SU office. Um, and so know that the search committee will be looking to have it be made up of teachers, staff, students, a board member. Um, and so the process that we'll have is we will have uh, forums for students 
to give feedback and the attributes and qualities that they're looking for in their next principal. Uh, we'll be doing the same with our teachers and staff, um, and then also having community forum uh, as well. And so the process of that is to then have that information that will be shared with the um, search committee so that they have that information as a lens when they're ranking candidates uh, to decide who to interview. Um, so I will tell you that the timeline that you have is um, it's certainly a tight timeline. Um, I will say this though to you as well, we had a tight timeline when we looked for Onda uh, and we decided that we didn't have the right candidates and we decided to extend and we resulted in Onda, which has been, I believe, a really terrific hire. Uh, Onda Adams, our chief academic officer. So that, that decision, though, was made by the, the committee. They looked through the, the candidates and decided that extending made more sense at that time. So that would be a committee decision based on the candidate pool. Uh, and then we will have finalists uh, here on campus to visit. Um, and they would then have an opportunity to interview again with the community with students, with staff, um, myself, and then we would make a determination uh, about bringing a finalist to the board. So I just wanted to walk through that, and if anyone has any questions, um, I certainly could take them. Um, does it make sense to, if we're gonna have a board representative on the um, committee, does it make sense to figure out who we're gonna have? That actually would be great, because we're not gonna meet again. Right. All right. Are there, does anybody want to volunteer to um, be part of the um, principal search committee? Anybody particularly interested? I think Shannon has her hand raised. <laughs> Peggy, just turn on her mic. I can, I'm just doing negotiations right now, which is also a lot of meetings. Yeah. Um, but, um, so if there's ever any conflict. I do think it's going to take about eight to 10 hours of time. Uh, that's the commitment level I think that a committee member should expect by the time that we review candidates, go through interviews, um, right around there. Okay. Um. I mean, I'm, I'd be willing to help as long as we can work it around so it's not when I'm doing chores. Um, okay, and why don't, why don't we uh, talk, we can email around and, and see who makes sense and we'll get back to you. Yeah, just email me. Yep. I think Andrew's ready. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, and this might be a bit, you know, like maybe it would have been better to have an actual agenda item for it. But um, I'm just curious, you know, when David left us last year and we kind of reorganized our principal structure, I'm just curious what people's thoughts are as to how that's going and how it's working out with the current structure that we have and whether we should do any sort of reconsideration at this time. Well, I haven't given that a ton of thought. Uh, other than I would say, I think anytime you have a principal going across two campuses, it has bumps. Uh, although I think Reed's done a nice job um, of stepping in when Andrew's not here, and the same with Owen when Andrew's not here. Um, I think at this time, my plan is to hire a, a high school principal. Although what I would say to you is that through the search process, if it seems like the candidate pool that we're having may not link to that, that I think as a board, we, in a, as an admin team, we may come to you and say, we need to look at this differently. Um, but at this point, I was planning to look for a high school principal. The ad will be posted as a high school principal. Right. Okay, well, yeah. But again, I, that is a caveat to say that, um, the, you know, one of the things that the ad you'll see is talking about trying to foster a team of leaders, uh, which I think these three have done well. Um, and when I meet with them, they certainly advocate based on 
the level that they serve, but I believe as we talk now that when I talk to them, they can talk much more fluidly across grade levels. Like I hear Reed talking about the elementary program and I can hear, you know, Andra talk about the high school program or Owen talk about the elementary high school program. So, and if I'm speaking at a turn, any one of you can speak up, but I will just say as an outsider, when I sit in meetings now, it's so much clearer to me that you they have that pre-K-12 perspective. I don't think that's largely due to the fact that we have these new committees that we had to put together that are representative pre-K to 12. So, and the, the gift of meeting on a computer, right, across two campuses, we're able to hear the voices of different kids who show up. I mean, and just so you know, I mean, there was different proposals when we originally came to you, right? Like, when we did this change, there was some other proposals we wrestled with. We did wrestle with a principal um, of both campuses in, in building principals that had more responsibilities to that building. That is something that we had discussed. Um, so that you had a pre-K-12 focus, but you had people who were devoted to that building or on that building it was predictable that they were the building principal that is something that we had discussed uh, previously it's not anything we've discussed in the last few months okay well I guess uh, you know if you guys are think that this is still our, our best structure that we could have then let's keep going with it but if we if you do have any thoughts about it now would be the time since we're doing the budget and everything mm -hmm. so want to think about it think about it <laughs> yeah and I, and I do think you know um, part of it that may we will think about it I appreciate that and I think part of what you know could change our mind around it is seriously the candidate pool. Mm -hmm. um, you know I will tell you that the skill set of a leader is none of us have all the skills number one um, we all have strengths and weaknesses but certainly the high school principal work is very different than the elementary principal work. Um, and then there's middle school principal, which actually I was just joking with Owen, it was not my favorite work by any means as an administrator. Um, because I felt like students regressed. And I couldn't uh, figure it out, K-12, why all of a sudden they regressed at middle school. Other than that's how the brain works. Um, but I appreciate that, I think, that as we go through the process, it may align to a recommendation, possibly. I think getting feedback from faculty and students and staff may help that inform that too. I also, I, we're building the concept of a team and the license is pre-K-12. And I think we need to be able to support each other. So like when I win the lottery, somebody could step in immediately. But I do think it's important that we know how to, know what the other programming's doing and support that person in that role. And I, I feel great about our team and our other teams that we have connected now. We have a lot of talent around us. All right. Uh, do you wanna talk about our hire? So? Mm -hmm. I talked to some about it, but about yeah. pathways. Yeah, I think we've talked a little bit about him. Yeah, I mean you. Yeah, you. I couldn't remember his name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Ben Boynton is going to be our new flexible pathways coordinator. Uh, Jamie talked a little bit about his background. Um, very experienced uh, and has worked with staff, high school staff a lot. So I, I think he's going to be able to step right in and pick up the ball and run with it. And uh, I've got some exciting plans for how we, we start that work. Okay. All right, uh, moving on to public comment. Do we have any public comment at this time? Okay. And then we'll go to executive session for contracts. Um, and it'd be to? good, I think, to have it. Actually, if you're willing, all the administrators in. Okay. Um, so, to entertain. Uh, and then, uh, I think our student rep can be here as well. It's just, we'll re 
remember executive session is executive yeah. session. I, I actually have to leave. Oh, did I go? That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'd entertain a motion to enter executive session, inviting the administrators. So moved. Second. Well, we probably need some language about because to do so would put us at yeah, put us at risk. Uh, it's, it's nice to see you, Nice to see you. Thank you, guys. I'll start putting that language on each agenda so you guys have it. Yeah. That used to be really helpful. <laughs> so is that good then?